releasing our report, uh, Medical Alert, Climate Change is Harming Our Health in Wisconsin. And uh, again, a special uh, shout out to Brico Fund for being the, uh, the granting agency, the granting foundation behind our work. So I wanna go back uh, a little bit for historical context. You know, climate change as a health issue has been known for a long time. This is from the first U.S. national assessment on climate change. And um, I co-chaired the health panel, the health report for the national assessment. So this is not brand new, but this is something that has been known for a long time. It's just that we realize it's now urgent and, and the health community has come on board very strong and we need to do something very quickly. So this is going back 20 years. And as I mentioned, uh, just yesterday was the 50th anniversary for the National Academy of Medicine. And their two paired themes for the annual conference yesterday was COVID-19 and climate change. Um, I'm not gonna really go deeply into any of these slides. It's just by way of orientation to uh, give you a sense for why, why personally I've dedicated my career to this problem. I think it's the largest environmental public health challenge of our times. And you can see how climate change uh, affects our health through all these different pathways and all the health outcomes there. But in addition to the risks, um, a key thing to really harp on is that there are major opportunities for health in solving the climate crisis. For example, getting to clean energy. We know that air pollution kills uh, 7 million people every year. Um, an unhealthy diet uh, that is especially um, not enough plant-based diet uh, kills seven, uh, 11 million people every year. And our sedentary lifestyles from over-dependence on automobiles is estimated to kill 5 million people a year. So to get to a clean energy economy offers amazing, amazing um, health benefits. So I'm going to show just a couple of snapshots uh, of the report. I'm not really gonna talk deeply about it because I encourage you to get out your iPhones or your, your phones, your Samsung, your, your, uh, whatever, all the other versions of phones. Uh, and take a picture of that URL uh, that can get you to the report, directly to the report that you can download and you can actually read um, what I'm gonna go over very quickly because we wanna get into the panel discussion very soon. So um, I'll just pause for you to take that picture. And once again, a shout out to Rico Fund for, for making this effort possible. The link is also in the chat. Oh, great. Thanks, Brianna. Okay, so just this is, these are snapshots from the report. Um, obviously, heat waves are a big deal with climate change. Uh, the projections are that Wisconsin is going to see uh, two to three times as many very hot days and very high heat index. We also uh, show the issues climate change is just not about temperature. And, and, and warming. It's also about extremes of the water cycle. We know that very well in Wisconsin, the severe flooding we've had across the Midwest. This map from the National Atmospheric and Oceanic Administration, NOAA, shows uh, projections for future precipitation and everything with the hash lines has, is st statistically significant. So we are definitely going to be getting uh, much wetter and that's, that's a risk for water quality and our health. Of course, uh, diseases, especially carried by insects, are very sensitive to small changes in, in, in uh, weather, uh, especially temperature changes. Remember, insects are cold-blooded, so a tiny change in temperature makes all the difference in uh, disease uh, dynamics, transmission dynamics. Uh, diseases like West Nile virus, um, the tick-borne diseases, but uh, the most sensitive ones are the mosquito-borne diseases to climate. That'll be on the pop quiz at the end of this. <laughs> now, this slide, um, I wanna just give a little extra, a few seconds extra on this one because it's so important. 
Um, some of our, a couple of our students is led by a past student, uh, David, David Abel and Conscious Fear here at UW Madison did a report um, answering the question, can Wisconsin produce all of its energy in, in state rather than out of state from the coal fired power plants that are out of state? So number one, can we produce all of our energy in state? And secondly, if, if most all of that en energy is from clean power, you know, can we do it? And so we have an energy scenario of in-state clean energy. And look at all these uh, health benefits. If you look at the map of Wisconsin on the right, you know, we would save uh, almost 2,000 lives every year from with clean energy and all the, the other lists below that of avoided health problems. And on the left side, you know, the, the take home message, if you add this up, the reduction in fine particle pollution and ground level smog ozone would lead to a savings from less death and hospitalization of $21 billion in health savings every year. And it would net 162,000 new jobs in renewable energy. So these are big, important uh, uh, issues. And I think uh, Joel Charles will talk a little bit more about this as well. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce the panelists. I'm really gonna just mention them right here, but and, and when I call on them, I'll let them introduce themselves further. Uh, we have uh, Pam uh, Goodman, a nurse from, from Eau Claire. We have a uh, Charantan Muka Padiai, who is a, an, an eye doctor from Milwaukee. We also have from Milwaukee, uh, an ER doctor, Caitlin Rubley. And uh, from UW-Madison, we've got Karen uh, Zuggi. Uh, and also calling in, but not listed, uh, apologies, is um, uh, Shanda Demorest, who is uh, from Minnesota, and she's with Practice, uh, Practice Green Health. So um, this is our panel, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so we can begin. And I am stopping that. So um, now, Brianna, let me ask you one quick question before we begin. Um, should we ask the audience to stop sharing their screens so we can see more of the panelists? What do you think? Uh, if people want, so whoever's speaking, their uh, oh, camera okay. will pop up. But if people want, in the upper right-hand corner, they can push speaker view instead of gallery view if they don't want to see everyone. Okay, yeah, never mind. That's a great thing. Upper right corner for Zoom. You yep. can check between panel or speaker view. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so don't, don't feel shy. You don't have to turn off your video unless you've got bad internet connection. Okay, let's jump in here. Let's start with Pam. If you could uh, introduce yourself and um, I'm going to ask you this question, which is uh, that you, you know, as a professor of nursing in Eau Claire, uh, how is the climate crisis affecting your region of Wisconsin? Uh, are there unique climate threats in uh, Northwest Wisconsin? Well, thank you, um, Jonathan. It's really wonderful to see everyone and uh, be on the panel with the rest of um, my colleagues and all of you who are climate activists. So it's great to see everyone's faces and know that you're in this, this challenge with us. Um, I'm a professor of nursing, as Jonathan, as you have identified, I have a doctorate of nursing practice in population health. And so I'm very focused in action, but also really focused in prevention. And uh, when you ask, you know, how is the climate crisis affecting my area of Northwest Wisconsin, especially I live an hour even further north of Eau Claire, I was initially going to pick up on the issues around how much more uh, damp we are, how much more precipitation that we've had, and primarily I wasn't expecting the nearly four inches of snowfall that we just had this late afternoon, um, and was going to really talk more about how we have more of the rain bombs, right? Um, and, you know, seeing how much that precipitation can really affect our farmers and the type of productivity that they have in their types of um, agricultural fields. 
Um, and, you know, I have uh, a gentleman that farms uh, right next to the home that I own. And my husband and I were talking about, geez, I hope he gets the soybeans off because, you know, the weather is going to change at some point. But we hadn't realized that it was going to be snow. Uh, thankfully, he did get his soybeans off. And so that's a good thing for him. Um, but, you know, these are some challenging aspects for most of Wisconsin. But I would say here in northwest Wisconsin, we're seeing those challenges as well. Um, my dad is 84 years old. He still is farming a very small, uh, uh, primarily a Black Angus um, type of, of hobby farm, so to speak. And, you know, he and I and the rest of my family and many of his uh, neighbors talk about, you know, how the weather has changed, how are they going to get their crops on and off. And I think concerningly for me is that I've pre pretty much grown up rural and I hear from him um, and amongst my community members that when we look at what's happening with our farmers, especially, there's a lot of mental health issues and stress because not only of the economic impact that we've known have been happening with, uh, especially our national policies, but when we throw in climate change in on top of that and trying to weather this, the difference in the, the um, weather patterns, it's very challenging. And when you add in uh, the aspects around, you know, the stress of, of trying to make a living on small farms, seeing those kind of erode, and that also has some impacts for not only mental health of our farmers, but also in our communities and our economic um, aspects as well. Uh, when I think about, um, you know, unique climate threats to Northwest Wisconsin, you know, nurses, uh, we're the largest healthcare workforce. We're typically, along with physicians and other healthcare providers, one of the most trusted uh, healthcare providers as well. And one of the things that I think, and I'm speaking more or less from a public health nurse that is on the ground level, oftentimes with uh, community members and doing a lot of surveillance, kind of always watching to see what's going on. You hear not only about the challenges around the mental health pieces, but also the challenges that are occurring in regards to Lyme's disease, as um, Jonathan just pointed out, the babesiosis, the ehrlichiosis. I mean, these uh, types of diseases are affecting our population. And you see those in uh, community and public health where oftentimes you may hear and see these types of things, uh, even as people go into primary care or the emergency room. And so we see a lot of those different things. Um, I do want to mention one thing that for me personally, as I saw the baby that is kind of the, the picture of, of the Brico grant and, and the um, uh, the publication that is there. You know, we have a baby that is showing that there is some challenges with their um, ability to breathe. We see the little mask on, on you know, uh, uh, an infant. And my family has been personally affected by asthma at a pretty significant level. And there's nothing more scarier than to see how the air pollution and the particles are negatively affecting the ability of people to breathe. And when it's in your own family and you see the air hunger, when you see them struggling to breathe, that's really a, a difficult thing. So as a, as a nurse, um, seeing all these different aspects and, you know, whether it's Northwest Wisconsin specifically or other areas, it's definitely something that as nurses, we're uh, on, on the ground as well with everyone else who's concerned about climate. Uh, Pam, thanks very much. And quick, quick follow up, because you are a professor of nursing. How how is this? How's the climate change crisis or the climate crisis affected the nursing profession and training? Well, I know that in uh, the courses that I'm teaching, we do have a, a session on climate change. So I wrap it in with environmental health. And my students hear this, you know, quite frequently on how we need to be as nurses advocating and in the action aspect. So we do cover it in our curriculum as a uh, bachelor's of science of nursing. One of the aspects to be a BSN prepared nurse, we cover community, public, and environmental health. And not that we have a whole lot of time um, in our curriculum that is, of course, very, very tight, but we do talk about that. And I expose um, the nursing students to various nursing organizations and other healthcare professional organizations as well to help them understand the um, impacts of, of health and from the uh, aspects of climate change and, and what is occurring. So we certainly have that covered. In fact, this last summer, I had a nursing student who worked with me and we did a community level intervention uh, with a very rural 
uh, community and we did eight sessions uh, every almost every week for eight weeks and the editor of this very rural local paper allowed us to put in some uh, community education aimed at those rural communities to get some really good factual health climate related information into them. Great. Thank you, Pam. So uh, Toronto, uh, this is a very special day of the month for you. And as I say why in a second, I just want to remind everyone to go ahead and put their questions in the chat. We probably won't get to all of them, but uh, Brianna, you're screening and picking out some because uh, I can't concentrate on both at the same time. <laughs> so go ahead and put your questions in the chat if you have any. So Toronto, this is uh, one of your 12th favorite days as an eye doctor from Milwaukee. Here we are, October, 2020. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is a, a special <laughs> year for you. So, good, so yeah, it's a good year for us. <laughs> so as, a doc, as an eye doctor from Milwaukee, um, why, why have you become so active in uh, raising the attention about climate change? And as a medical specialist, um, are other ophthalmologists as concerned as you? I am an eye doctor, um, but primarily I'm a 40 year old human male with two children. And when I look into the future, I look into their future. And I started getting involved with uh, climate action because of my status as a, as a human being and as a father. And as I started this process, I, I started to learn more about the effects of climate on ocular health, which is something that a lot of my ophthalmology colleagues probably don't uh, really understand. And that's part of the mission of, of Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action is not just educating the public about these links or policymakers, but educating our colleagues. And there is a burgeoning sense of the impact of climate on ocular health among my profession. Uh, this summer, there was a, an article published in our um, Academy's newsletter from David Chang, who's, a, who's an executive there, um, about these links. And he mentioned the medical consortium on climate and health and how uh, ophthalmologists really need to be aware of these. So, so you know, in, in terms of health risk, the eye is a very small, delicate organ. It's two centimeters, it's squishy, and we're putting it in an oven. And like the rest of the human body, it, it is very impacted by levels of heat and humidity and pollution in the air. Uh, so we're seeing uh, climate change affect the allergy season. People that were seasonal allergy uh, sufferers are now perennial al allergy sufferers. And, and I see that anecdotally in my practice. Uh, so, so that is, uh, you know, firsthand something I'm seeing. But in a larger sense, we are a surgical subspecialty and we perform uh, perhaps the most common surgical procedure in the world, which is cataract surgery and one that's very successful. And so we have a special obligation to uh, take steps to reduce the carbon footprint of our actions. So I'll give you a small example. In India, they can do a cataract surgery and generate about a quarter kilogram of waste, three quarters of which is recyclable. Furthermore, they, the amount of carbon pollution that they generate with one cataract surgery is the equivalent of driving a car 25 kilometers. In the US, we generate anywhere from two to four kilograms of waste, all of which goes into landfill or biohazard. And then our uh, carbon impact is driving a car 500 kilometers for the exact same surgery. And you may think, oh, well, we do it safer, it's more sterile, there are better outcomes. No, that's not true either. There's no higher rates of infection here than, than there. So um, I think there is a growing movement within ophthalmology, uh, like what's happening in the larger health community um, that's trying to understand these changes and trying to you know, advocate for it. I think a lot of what we do is driven by patient perception. People think, oh, you know, I don't want to use reusable whatever, but a lot of that is, is because of, um, you know, the fact that people feel safer, even though they aren't really safer with those kinds of things. So, so I think in a lot of ways, this has to be a, a provider-led effort where if we can convince ourselves of what is true, that we can achieve the same outcomes with less waste, we can do this sustainably, then the patients will uh, also, you know, come to accept that. And so education is a first step and that's why I got involved. Great. Toronto, let me ask you a follow-up question, um, which is, um, you know, you're in Milwaukee and actually 
all of Wisconsin has a lot of racial disparity and uh, certainly it's, it's in the big cities. Um, any comments about climate impacts across uh, this challenging issue that how, you know, those most vulnerable might be the most susceptible. You wanna say anything about your views from where you sit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Milwaukee is maybe the most segregated city in the United States, if not the world. And it is truly shameful. My practice has offices all over the city and it, it is night and day in terms of health outcomes, in terms of uh, educational outcomes, uh, based on the neighborhood, based on which office I practice in. Uh, and, and a lot of these communities of color, they're in flood prone areas, they're in areas where highways run through them, so they're, or, or they're, you know, near waste sites or, or power plants, and this is a, you know, very uh, historical, systemic, very intentional uh, thing that has happened. And so, you know, one of our members, Andrew Lewandowski, who's on our board, I have to give him credit because he said, you know, the way we have to think about ourselves is that we are an anti-racist organization that is focused on climate. Um, so that's that's kind of the lens that I look at all our work through is that we start with that uh, as a baseline because that impacts absolutely everything and the way we address those disparities is through our work in climate. Right. You know, as you mentioned, uh, Andrew, people like Andrew, and there are a lot of uh, members uh, here participating in the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action, new, uh, this uh, very active group. Uh, I wanna just tell the audience that Toronto is actually the current uh, chair of, the, of this organization. So thank you for your leadership and for inspiring others. And I, and I still, I wanna push back, I've been, you know, my father was an ophthalmologist and I always asked him to oh. start up a, a, far, a far-sighted project on climate change. So I'm glad that you're, that. you people like you and David Chang are uh, taking the ophthalmologist forward on climate change. Thank you. Well, thank you for your leadership, Jonathan. So next I wanna to turn to uh, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin, you're from, uh, Caitlin Rubley. You're from Milwaukee, you're an emergency medicine doc. You took an extra year of training, a, a fellowship to study climate change uh, and medicine before you, know, before you started practicing here. So can you uh, tell us you know, what motivated you to take an ec whole extra year of study uh, to look into this as an ER doc? Absolutely. So I am in the unique space of emergency medicine, which uh, houses wilderness medicine, disaster medicine, as well as global health. Out of that came this fellowship, and I was only the second fellow to essentially focus on national and international climate change policy. And the number one motivator for that was my patients. So I was fortunate to train around in different emergency departments around the country. And I saw time after time after time um, again, about, about how climate change is impacting the health of people. And while all people are at risk, I noticed that specific populations, as has been mentioned, were suffering more. And so as an emergency medicine physician, I take care of all people at any time of the day or night and with any concern. And so that means for low-income communities, communities of color, incarcerated populations, um, correctional facilities officers, for example, who don't have access to air conditioning. Uh, that means uh, pa patients who are experiencing homelessness. I am the stop for any sort of medical care. It may be simple medication refills, for example, if they're displaced from flooding. It may be uh, actually the end result of a transfer from an emergency department that was flooded, and that includes rural and urban hospitals. Um, hearing their stories of resilience and knowing and learning about the science was really important to me. And so I, I saw this opportunity to step in as a health professional uh, to lead. Uh, I had a lot of medical students and residents and trainees uh, coming and asking, what can we do? What can we do? And I noticed that as much work as has been done, climate action was still rather undefined. And so as our report articulates, there's many opportunities for solutions. 
uh, and legislative potential uh, moving forward. And we as health professionals in our communities have the unique opportunity to use our communication skills and leadership skills across different sectors and partnerships um, to act on many of the health impacts we're seeing. As the, as the report says, instead of supporting fossil fuel infrastructure, we can support health infrastructure. That's extremely exciting. That means when a patient has an injury, a traumatic injury, uh, as a victim of violence, for example, they can come to me and be guaranteed that my ER will be open and it won't be flooded. Um, as, as temperatures increase, I worry that the costs are only going to uh, be greater for these health systems among the many other insults to them. And so how do we build climate resilient health systems and prepare now so that we're able to respond and be there for our communities? Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Now, I just want to ask you a pointed question because you're an ER doc. Is climate change an emergency? Absolutely. So my job is to differentiate sick from not sick people. And so if you're sick, I'm deciding what's wrong with you, what are the next steps, you know, putting you on life support in very severe circumstances and deciding if you need to go to the critical care unit or if you can go to the floor or if we think you're safe for discharge. Right now, the planet is sick and we have this really narrow opportunity and window of which to act. And we have solutions that are available. You'll read about them in the report, you'll hear about them tonight, but we have this opportunity to act and it's really exciting to be able to prescribe essentially um, health benefits for our neighbors and ourselves. Great. Caitlin, thanks very much. So I want to next go to Karen, um, who is a practicing anesthesiologist at the University of Wisconsin here in Madison. Uh, Karen, you, you lead the sustainability uh, team at the hospital. And that sounds like a big responsibility for someone that is a practicing anesthesiologist. You know, how do you manage that? Uh, why did you sign up for that extra work? <laughs> And, and more importantly, well, not more importantly, but also what, uh, what are some of the big achievements uh, so far in uh, that you've accomplished, or not you, but have gotten the hospital to sign up for? What do you think of the next low hanging fruit, you know, easy, easy things to achieve for sustainability and maybe the, the uh, slightly more difficult ones? Can you talk about that, those issues? Sure. Um, as an anesthesiologist, I work in the operating room, making sure that people get through their surgery safely. And uh, similar to Tarantin and Caitlin, I noticed that we have just an enormous amount of waste. It's, it's, it's impressive to me. And the operating room is a huge, um, is a huge uh, revenue generator for most hospital systems because of how we pay for healthcare in this country. And if you make, if you have a large volume of, um, of surgeries that you do every year. And at UW Health, we do over 30,000 surgeries of all types every year. And if we can reduce our waste for every case by just a little bit, by like, um, like was mentioned earlier, like half of a kilogram or something like that, or if we can encourage people to use slightly less polluting types of anesthesia gases and that sort of thing, we can make an enormous difference. So it started out with um, a waste tracking uh, initiative that some of our techs who stock the rooms um, were noticing. They said people are opening all of these supplies that they sometimes don't even use. Can we train people and educate them to use something different or to favor reusables? And so we did some simple interventions um, with pre-stocking everything with reusables and putting them at sort of like in the front, just like choice architecture, and then making the disposables harder to get to or putting with some barriers in for, for um, the pharmaceuticals that were more polluting, saying like you have to go to pharmacy to get these, whereas the ones that are greener and a little bit less expensive are kind of right here, readily available. Um, all things being equal and making sure that everything was equally safe. And then after tracking that cost savings, um, we had a grassroots green team sort of going at the hospital that was underway a little bit. And um, around the time that that was formalized into a sustainability program with an energy management and sustainability director who's my partner in this, 
um, Mary Everstatz, I proposed that I could um, be the medical director to help provide, to have a clinician involved with that. And so we really, over the last several years, over um, since 2012, I've been giving an annual lecture and making these small um, sort of choice architecture changes around the operating room. And we saved about $30,000 a month for our health system in the operating rooms alone. And we reduced our carbon footprint of the of perioperative services by 70%. So that just in that small area and all with choice and not really mandating anything, which was great. There's so much more that we could do. There's a lot happening at UW Health with energy management and energy efficiency, looking at retrofitting some of our HVAC systems, um, trying to make sure that when we have new construction that we try to favor um, energy, um, energy savings and greener, um, greener energy in particular. So I've really gotten involved with a lot of that. Great. Thank you. Now, uh, you have a colleague uh, that has also joined us, and we're lucky to have uh, Shonda uh, Demarest uh, from Minnesota, who's on the line. She uh, is part of Practice Green Health. And uh, Shonda, I'm wondering if you can add on to what Karen just said and give us uh, a look at this, the green practices statewide across Wisconsin, because I know that there are a lot of hospitals uh, already moving forward. So uh, Shonda, if we can pipe you in from uh, Minnesota and uh, have you uh, follow up on uh, Karen's uh, work. Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. And congratulations, Wisconsin, for this terrific work. I'm, I'm excited as you know, somebody across the river to, to get to hop on this line. Um, so in addition to working for Practice Green Health, which I'll describe a bit about, I'm, I'm also a cardiac nurse by background and have been pretty involved in Minnesota health professionals for a healthy climate. So, so kudos to this org for coming together. Um, from, from the big picture, Practice Green Health and, and Healthcare Without Harm perspective, actually, so we're a national nonprofit that works with hospitals and health systems to help do exactly like what Karin was just talking about reduce the environmental footprint of the healthcare sector, but, but even bolder than that, help bring these hospitals to, um, you know, to a point where they're practicing climate smart healthcare. And so um, nationally, there are about 1,100 hospitals that work with Practice Green Health, but in Wisconsin, there are, there are just under 70. And I see a handful of folks on the line tonight from some of those organizations represented. I mean, Advocate Aurora has a bunch of hospitals that are part of Practice Green Health. UW Health, as, as we've heard, Gunderson Health, of course, and I see Jeff Thompson on the line, um, Health Partners, Mayo Clinic, the VA even, Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, and, and certainly more. And so what's really exciting about this is that there are more and more health organizations coming together to address sustainability, but also climate action within their orgs. And, and some of these systems are, are, are part of something called the Healthcare Climate Council, um, so Advocate, Ascension, Gunderson, Health Partners, and as part of that Climate Council, they're actually setting carbon reduction goals, public carbon reduction goals. And in healthcare, we're a little bit behind the eight ball when it comes to some of these bold sustainability and, and climate initiatives, but these are the systems that are out front doing it, in some cases setting carbon neutrality goals. And you know, when we talk about climate and sustainability and that interconnectedness, we heard Karen mention waste and, and energy, a lot of work within the operating room. But some of these hospital systems are also addressing the food system, our industrial agricultural system, for instance, and reducing their carbon footprint in essence when it comes to the food they're bringing into the hospital. Um, UW Health is, is quite impressive in that area. Or we look at the supply chain. Supply chain has an immense amount of um, carbon emissions going in and out of it. And obviously we know we do a lot of supply purchasing um, as health professionals. Um, we, we work with folks in the transportation space and try to encourage hospitals to build a green fleet or um, encourage their employees to, you know, to, to have fewer single occupancy vehicle trips, for instance. 
Or in the case of Gunderson, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. They were the first system to attain energy independence ever in 2014. Um, and, and so we're seeing major, major, um, not only just trends, but huge progress in this space. And seeing this from a national level, I'm really encouraged by what's happening in Wisconsin. And what's unique is that your health organization from a community level is connecting these human health dots within the organizations. And, and that can't be said across the country. Um, so thanks for the chance to connect. I'll drop a couple links for Practice Green Health and Healthcare Without Harm into the chat if you're interested in learning a little more. Shonda, thanks, thanks so much for that perspective. That's, that's really encouraging. And uh, I know from you know, our colleague and, and co-author co on this, uh, Ed Maybach, who heads up the uh, Center for Climate Change Communication, you know, they've done surveys every year, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 years, uh, surveys of attitudes across the country. And uh, you could see, uh, you'll see in the report, the first map we have is uh, by county, how many Wisconsinites are concerned or at least believe that climate change is real. It's set, it's 69% in the state of Wisconsin. So that's uh, Ed Maybach's work. It's a report, the survey comes out every year called uh, The Six Americas, Different Attitudes. So I want to turn to Joel Charles, who uh, he and I go way back. He was a medical student that I uh, encountered a long time ago when I first came here. Uh, Joel, you're a practicing uh, family doc in uh, rural Wisconsin in, in Viroqua. So um, can you share some uh, concerns that your patients have and for your you're part of the state and, and what are they telling you and what are, what are you telling them uh, about this issue? Uh, and answer that before we go into a second follow-up question about uh, benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, just to give you a sense of, of why I work on this. Um, uh, you know, I grew up near a coal plant. I have asthma. so like everyone else in the world, my health has been impacted by the burning of fossil fuels. I did my family medicine residency in Santa Rosa, California, where we repeatedly saw our patients impacted by wildfires, whether that meant having heart attacks or um, just being displaced and suffering psychological trauma. Uh, the residency that I trained at, um, the year I finished, that residency actually burnt and had to close for three years in the big tubs fire in Santa Rosa. Um, and then I moved back here to, uh, with my wife, who's also a family doc, to practice in rural southwest Wisconsin. And our son was born on the night of the August 2018 uh, floods that were unprecedented. And um, I just, you know, I remember holding him and there was just terrible uh, storm outside. And I knew the implications of that. And I worried about my patients uh, being flooded out of their homes. Um, which ended up happening to several of my patients and, you know, they're still impacted by that. Uh, and so I feel like I've been sort of being chased by climate change um, and I want to protect my son from this and I want to protect my patients. And this is an issue which is going to impact everybody in urban and rural areas. But to speak specifically to rural areas, as I mentioned, um, these rain bombs that Pam talked about, it's just unprecedented uh, heavy rainfall events that we're seeing. Um, studies have shown that they cause significant amounts of um, contamination and infection of people's private wells, which a lot of us depend on out here, including myself and my family. Um, and that can make people sick. Um, there's some great research done up by Marshfield uh, connecting heavy rainfall events with kids going into the emergency room with di dehydration from diarrheal illnesses. But people also get displaced from their homes, which means, you know, if you have somebody with heart failure and they don't have their meds or they don't have their scale to be watching their weight closely, somebody who is like just on the edge can really kind of tip into ending up in the hospital. Um, but you also see that a lot of these areas that are prone to flooding are, many of them are more low income. Those people are less able to adapt and to kind of cope with the stresses that this causes. So there's a real justice component to this as well. We're also, you know, 
in, in our community, there's a lot of people who work outside. And so when we have these heavy, these um, extreme heat events, people don't have the option of just staying inside and turning up the air conditioner. The work has to get done. The fields have to get taken care of. The power lines need to be cleared. Um, you know, the logs need to come down. Uh, so a lot of these people just have to work through it. And that's another way in which this is sort of a social justice issue because a lot of those jobs tend to be a little bit, um, you know, not paying as well as some of the white collar jobs. Um, and these people are outside serving us, um, being exposed to these threats. At the same time, those people who are working outside are exposed to ticks and, and having issues with Lyme disease, which can have really devastating lingering impacts on people. But as I said, you know, at the same time, all of our patients are being impacted by the burning of fossil fuels every day. And um, so that means that we have a major opportunity. So it's important to point out that, you know, the poor and people of color has been mentioned before, that these people produce less of the pollution but are exposed to more of it. So this is a justice issue again. Um, we're also seeing that in the context of COVID, where people um, of color, um, low-income people are exposed to more air pollution, they're dying at higher rates of COVID-19. Um, but it also means that if we trans transition away from fossil fuels, that this is a major gain for equity in this country, because if we can stop the air pollution from fossil fuels, we can make major gains in creating more equity in health outcomes. And that's gonna benefit everybody. That's gonna benefit people in urban communities, people in rural communities. Um, as your, the report shows, if we transition to a 100% renewable clean energy economy and 100% clean energy economy in Wisconsin, we would save 1900 lives a year. That is a reason to do this on its own, even if you didn't care about climate change. And the other piece here that really impacts rural communities is that rural communities have the land to produce the energy that's needed for this transition. And so one of the things that impacts health in our communities is lack of funding for schools, lack of funding for roads, mental health struggles of dairy farmers who are really struggling economically. Well, the logical solution to this transition is that rural communities produce the power that urban communities need and you have this economic benefit to rural communities where farmers get an added income source, the added tax base can be used to keep our schools open and our roads rebuilt. And then you have all these rural jobs. So it's just, there's no reason not to make this transition. Joel, well, uh, thanks very much. And I just wanna um, mention a talk at the National Academy on Sunday from an energy expert uh, from Princeton University who showed that it's the rural communities and the most rural states that will ha get the most, have the most to gain. Uh, you know, climate change is a jobs program and especially mm -hmm. for rural communities. Um, and, and then in my intro, I, I talked about not only energy and air pollution, but the idea of transportation benefits in urban centers and then um, more plant-based diets as a benefit for, for everyone. Um, but there are you know, things that we need to take care of as a medical community. For example, coal miners, um, we absolutely cannot burn more coal, but as a profession of compassionate people, we need to be serious about investing and make sure that coal mining communities and these types of communities are taken care of uh, in a serious way. Um, so that's something that we, I think we're gonna have to be doing, uh, stepping in and can, you know, carrying that message as well. Um, so let me just ask, uh, because you're all in the health field and some of you, a lot of you are training students, any comments on what things we ought to be doing to uh, prepare our future leaders that we're training. Um, start with, uh, how about Pam? And then, uh, let's see, Pam, anyone, Pam, you start and then anyone else chime in. And then, and then I think we'll open it up to um, audience questions. Um, Brianna has been fielding these and she'll um, 
I think she'll bundle the first three because we don't want to go over time. Uh, and so quick qu question about medical training, uh, health healthcare training. And then um, Brianna, I'll let you read a couple of questions that have come in and, and we're saving all of this. And maybe, maybe eventually we'll get to all your questions by email. I won't promise that, but uh, maybe we'll have some follow-up dialogue. Okay, so Pam, do you wanna chime in? Sure. Well, you know, thanks. I mean, it's a perfect question for me because I have always been a public health nurse for the most part for the majority of my career. So health to me has always been very broad and hasn't necessarily been as specific into a specific, a specific med surge approach. So again, that prevention piece, looking at environmental health aspects. And so I think for our future healthcare professionals, uh, and I'll speak more from the nursing piece, is really helping nurses, uh, future nurses, understand that regardless of where it is that you work, whatever wherever it is that you find your passion, whether it's in the ER, whether it's in surgery, whether it's in um, public health, whether it's in long-term care, there is a role for you as a nurse, as a healthcare professional, to really do things at either an individual level or at a community level and certainly at a systems level and really engage in um, uh, systems, in the policy change, and to join organizations that are very active and to help um, hold accountable our uh, fossil fuel industry who has really basically put smoke over our eyes and have not been forthright in all of the information that we know is really hurting our um, planet and our health as well. So um, just really looking at health much more broadly and helping them see that regardless of where it is that they can work, they have a way to always have an impact on climate and environmental health and especially in the racial justice issues. Wow, well, the smoke in your eyes, that's such a great metaphor. So that's such a great question. I don't know if I'll ask anyone else to pipe pipe in before we go to other questions, unless someone has a gold, a gold nugget to add. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to Brianna. All right, awesome. Um, I just wanted to address something. I think Joel would like to talk about the resolution and then we should open oh, it to questions. Good point, thank you, thank you. Um, so Joel. Uh, Joel, has, Joel Charles has some very exciting news. It's not news because it happened in August, but it is, it's big, it's huge. And he had a, a leadership role in this. Joel, take it away. Give, give everyone the, uh, the really great news. Yeah, so, so I'm a member of the Wisconsin Medical Society, which is the leading organization of physicians in Wisconsin, which currently has over uh, 9,000 physicians and is a strong advocacy voice, both for physicians and our patients and the general health of Wisconsinites. And we participate in determining kind of what the policies are of the society and what they advocate for. And uh, in August, uh, we passed a policy that um, is in direct alignment with the latest science on recommendations for climate change. So um, passed without much resistance, essentially endorsing the UN IPCC's um, science that says warming needs to be kept to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to 2010 levels. Uh, and then in order to do that, global carbon emissions need to decrease 45% by 2030 and reach net to zero by 2050. Um, but it goes further to list specific policy types uh, that, can, that should be pushed to reach those goals emphasizing in particular that those policies should be written in a way to have equitable effects. So the justice piece is important, but some of those policies are carbon pricing, performance standards, so things like um, fuel efficiency standards or efficiency standards on appliances, um, funding for research and development of clean energy uh, and carbon reduction measures, and also increased funding for mass, mass transit and what we call active transportation. So like bike infrastructure, stuff like that but also importantly, the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. And the last piece that it has is uh, that it says that the Wisconsin Medical Society will advocate for policies which assist communities and health systems to adapt to the health impacts of climate change. And critically, it says focusing on those most vulnerable. And this is really important because the this is sort of the 20,000 foot view of how to deal with the climate crisis. Um, 
from sort of a transitioning the energy system perspective, you need performance standards and you need investments, but all those things need to be designed with an eye towards justice because climate is impacting, gonna impact first and worst, as I said, the poor and people of color and generally people who have less power. So you need to go to the people who are most vulnerable. Um, but also um, as um, Jonathan Patz uh, alluded to earlier, you also need to protect um, people who work in the fossil fuel industry, the coal workers or the patient I saw the other day who whose uh, job is to repair the pumps at quick trips. Um, that person is gonna need to be able to land on their feet and have some training to participate in the new clean energy economy. Um, so that emphasis on justice is important. The other reason that I'm excited about this is that the, a policy that's this robust and this alignment aligned with the science just wouldn't have passed 10 years ago. And I think that's sort of an, in, an indicator of how much things have changed in the last 10 years. And all of you probably see that public understanding of this issue has really changed in the last 10 years. And I think the most important parts are we have a better understanding of the human impacts most importantly, the health impacts. We understand this is a human health issue and not an environmental issue. Society as a whole um, has um, a better understanding that tr transitioning to clean energy would boost the economy because one of the arguments used to be, you know, oh, this is going to tank the economy. Well, that's just not true. And that, that argument is old and tired and just not accurate. The third piece is that the technology that we need to make this transition has advanced so much. It's gotten so cheap, it's gotten so effective that we can solve the problem. And frankly, it's so cheap that it would make sense to do so even if those first two points weren't true. Lastly, enough states and other places have experimented with policies that we know what policies work now. So we know this is a health issue. We know it'll boost the economy to act on it. We have the technology we need to act on it. We know what policies to put in place to do it. So the sickness that um, Caitlin talked about, there's a cure for this sickness and that's, that cure is not a bitter pill. It's more like a chewable vitamin. It's good for everybody and it tastes good too. And really we just need to make sure that policymakers know about this solution. Uh, and that the implications of this are significant and that this is a major health opportunity. Wow, Joel, that is so fantastic. And I love that metaphor too. Uh, th this um, Wisconsin Medical Society uh, resolution was passed on August in August in 2020. And it's uh, when you download the report, it's on page 31, download the report and spread it around. This is huge and so important and, and a major advance. Uh, thank you, Joel, for your leadership on that. Um, Caitlin, I mean, um, Brianna, uh, go ahead and why don't you give us your three, three questions from the audience for our panelists to think about in our final few minutes. All right. You want me to ask them all at once? All at once. Who, who asked the question? And then add, put all three questions out and one panelist per question will just volunteer, self-select. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the first question is related to COVID-19. So the question is, is COVID-19 a threat multiplier for climate impacts or vice versa? Are there co-benefit solutions that will address both? That's question one. And who can, who asked that question? I wasn't quite keeping track because okay. not everybody had their last name I think I think, Larry, I think uh, Larry Hans uh, asked that question. Go ahead. Next one. Okay, question number two. Uh, how is the medical communi community addressing the politics and industry pushback? And question three I tied in together, which is how do we get our employers, large health systems to stop burning fossil fuels for energy? Great, those are three meaty questions that uh, one panelist will step forward and volunteer. And then we'll probably after these three questions have to close this out uh, because of time. So who wants to take, repeat the first one? Well, go yes. ahead, panelists, go forward. I'm sure you wrote it down. I can repeat it and I'll also put it in the chat. So is COVID-19 a threat multiplier for climate impacts or vice versa? Are there co-benefit solutions that will address both? Great, okay. This is Pam and I'm willing to take a, a um, a shot at it. Uh, you know, COVID-19 is really an infectious communicable disease that 
we know has um, arisen as a novel virus. And we're going to see more of these types of infectious diseases occurring as human habitat continues to get further and further into disrupting the natural ecological habitats. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of a multiplier effect in some ways because we as humans uh, have really precipitated the amount of global warming that has been occurring. This is occurring because of human activity and our uh, fossil fuel industry dependency that we have had. And um, not only is, are we gonna see more infectious and communicable diseases occurring as we continue to disrupt that ecosystem, uh, COVID-19 won't be the only one. We're seeing this as you know, we've talked already previously on, on here is you know, the Lyme's disease, the West Nile virus. Uh, Chippewa County had two West Nile virus uh, uh, deaths in the last couple of years. And you know, before that wasn't, you know, necessarily happening. So I don't know if I can ne necessarily separate them, but we certainly are going to see more of these happening just because of the changes that are occurring with global warming and the changes that occur. The other thing is, is that, you know, we're, we're a plane ride away from any type of any country, right? So it doesn't take very long. So those types of uh, diseases that may have been over in a different country that may have taken a little longer, given us maybe a little more time to adapt. But then again, we wouldn't, you know, have the technology or the communication either. So we may not have known when those are occurring. But, you know, we certainly are just a plain hop away from any type of exposure. We're tending to be very um, social people. So those are aspects that we know will continue to be part of our own um, livelihood going forward. Great. Thank you for your insights. Great, great answer. Who wants to take the second question? You say it again, Brianna. Yes, I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, it's also in the chat. So how is the medical community addressing the politics and industry pushback? And how do we get our employers' large health systems to stop burning fossil fuels for energy? I'd be happy to take at least the first half of that one. And Joe, you have 30 seconds. All right. So the, the most important point is that uh, the public overwhelmingly supports clean energy, unlike the 90% level. So whether you make this about climate change or clean energy, it makes sense to do. And that includes Republican voters, frankly. And we actually sent out a messaging document to every, trying to get it out to every candidate in Wisconsin saying there's very clear polling saying that Republican voters support um, clean energy and many of them support climate action and that that's growing really quickly. So regardless of your party affiliation, it is an electoral liability to not support action on climate change. And that's gonna become more clear over time and we're gonna do our best to communicate that. Great, great. And the last question, Brianna? Yeah, there was actually one that just came in that I would like to address. Go for it, go for it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up right after this. It's a 30, it's gotta be a 30 second answer. Go ahead. Okay. It says, how can we get more healthcare professionals to testify before the Public Service Commission during utility rate cases? Hmm. We need Andrew. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we sort of answered that one, which is we have a policy and advocacy work group. We're actually working with um, Heather Allen from Renew Wisconsin is, uh, is on the group often. And we're just let us know when those opportunities come up because we have lots of people who wanna make a difference. So just let us know when they're happening. I'd also um, love to add on to the second half of that last question um, for health professionals that are looking to get their healthcare systems off of fossil fuels. We do have a climate smart healthcare team as part of the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. Um, so we have a work group that works specifically on building power within health systems and trying to get them to change. Um, so I'll drop a link in the chat um, for how you can join our group, but we do have a group that works specifically on health you build power in your health system. Great, great. And because of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see the screen with the, uh, the way to access the report? Is that yes. good? You see it? So, um, yeah, so I just, uh, this is uh, the URL is at our Global Health Institute. It's on our website. So um, the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin, you can see the link there. You can take a picture of that as well. as The other one takes you directly to the report, but this takes you to a little more information um, and uh, at the Global Health Institute. So I think because of the hour, we better wrap up. Um, I thank all of the
panelists for their incredible insights and for the organizers, for Abby and Brianna and the, the writing team uh, for doing a, a bang up job, a great job on this tonight. And especially to the audience, uh, it looks like I think we peaked out over 115 as I saw, maybe I'm wrong, maybe a bit more, but uh, thank you all for taking time on, on a night uh, that may be quite busy, or at least it's rainy here. But uh, with that, go visit, uh, download this report, spread it around. Um, the whole point is to um, you know, get the, the truth out there that climate change is absolutely a health issue. It's, it's affecting us now. Uh, we know it's human caused and therefore we have solutions and we know it's solvable. And as you heard from Joel, and the exciting resolution passed by the um, Wisconsin Medical Society that there's no, no reason to delay the energy, uh, renewable energy and, and cheaper energy, clean energy is, um, we don't need to wait for it. It's really here. Um, it's like taking a, 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 a tasty sure. vitamin and not yeah. medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, I, I wrap this up and thank you all for uh, coming to this and uh, visit the website, download the report and spread the word, talk about climate change because it is a, a global health crisis. Thank you everyone. And I'm gonna just uh, close it down now. <laughs> <laughs>